So, uh, tonight, tonight we're going to look at a question that was raised last week, which I thought was a phenomenal question, which I didn't look at, and I think that we will look at it. Even if I don't think that we're not going to, even if I think that we're not going to look at it, it's too late now. Like, I've written the lesson, it's here, it's, it's ready, it's loaded, it, I guess we're doing it now. So, why, oh why, did Israel believe Moses, but then they didn't believe Jesus? Like, here's this, you know, this guy coming in from the desert, and he's like, oh yeah, I heard from God. And they're just like, okay, cool. But then here comes Jesus, and they're just like, eh. So why that? Why? why? Oh, well, the, 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 the question's simple. It's, it's the answer that gets complicated. Now, I'm going to give, I think, five or six different things as to what's going on here. Um... It, but I'm not going to say that that's going to look at all of what is involved here. So, uh, first off, I want to look at Exodus 40, verse 30 through 31. It says, yeah, this isn't all of verse 30. It starts in like halfway through verse 30. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Well, then we get to the Gospels, and, uh, you know, he's doing all this miraculous crap, and like, People are just like not really like, like they're they're using it like, oh man, he's gonna heal us. This is great, and then they go on their merry way and they're gonna like you know eat the food that he that he gives them because I mean we're hungry, <laughs> but I mean and then it kind of just stops there like oh he's a good guy or he's a prophet or whatever, and so why are they just like mm, whatever like, I didn't see anybody else <laughs> healing their sick and giving them food, but <laughs> I don't know maybe it's just me. Meanwhile, it seems like Moses they just kind of walk in real quick on so. Um, the first thing is, it, you know, it's easy to believe when someone shows you sympathy. Just kind of want to point this out. Um, so Moses walks into a bunch of slaves and says, hey, God cares about you. And uh, yeah, that's really easy to accept that message, isn't it? Jesus comes in and he says, you know, well, first John comes and prepares the way and says, repent. You all are a bunch of sinners. <laughs> Stop sinning. <laughs> Get ready for God. And, you know, that's a little bit harder to swallow, but people by and large were kind of accepting of John the Baptist. And not so much the religious leaders, but, you know, the people as a whole. So then Jesus shows up on the scene, and John the Baptist kind of just whoop, takes a back seat. And uh, so he's he starts doing his own his own ministry, his own, uh, you know, miracles and all these different things. And, um, you know, the message that he's teaching is a little bit different. Uh, the message he's teaching is, okay, I know you got the law from God. Um, yeah, about that. Uh, you all are kind of wrong. Well, that's a hard pill to swallow, okay? We know that we got this law from God. Now you're telling us that we're wrong. And then he says things that may sound contradictory to them, like, for instance, where he says, hey, um, you know, the law is going to pass away. And then where he also says, you know, uh, you know, uh, don't teach someone else to not follow the law. And it's like, well, which, <laughs> which, which one is it? So you have a lot of things there, and um, Jesus did that more or less on purpose, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but... Um, it seems like the biggest issue was the difference between Israel in when they were in captivity under Egypt. They didn't have a religious um, tradition that they followed. So they knew about their ancestor Abraham, okay, to various degrees. Maybe not all of them did, but by and large they understood the, the, the stories of their fathers. And they understood that this God was going to do something. And, but they didn't really have like an organized religion kind of thing going on. In fact, it says that there were just like random people that were being priests that were sacrificing things. And so then when Moses showed up to the scene, he kind of like redid the whole priest thing and made it where now there's a Levitical priesthood. And whereas before they didn't have that, they just kind of like, here's some young guy and he's going to be the priest, you know. And um, so you have this kind of unorganized kind of hodgepodge religion thing going on. Well, then when Moses shows up, that changes, and they have, like, an actual religion with, with rules and, 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 and what they're supposed to do and that kind of stuff. Well, so when Jesus shows up to the scene, this, this religion is very, very old, okay? And you have to understand Israel's history. So they had a long history of not listening to God, and so then they lose their place in the Promised Land, and they're like, oh, we kind of messed up here. This is really bad. So then when they finally are allowed back to the Promised Land, they're super-duper careful. They're like, we're not even going to mess up on the smallest little thing. So that's actually how the Pharisee sect was started, was they were like, let's make sure that we don't break the law ever again. So then they made a bunch of laws to make sure that they didn't even get close to breaking the laws. Like, let's say, for instance, um, the law was, hey, Nicole, don't pass this couch. 
And so then me as a Pharisee, I'm like, you know what? I think Nicole is going to eventually pass this couch. So, new rule. See the line before you get to the end of the couch, like over there where the Christian is? Yeah, you can't pass that one. So that when you inevitably do cross that one, hey, we're still good. You didn't pass and cross that one. God doesn't hate us. We're not getting kicked out. Well, the issue was, though, that they were imprisoned under, or not, well, I guess you could say imprisoned, whatever. They were conquered by the Greeks, and then by the Romans, and so they were living under Roman rule, and so they were just kind of like, well, maybe if we just double down and just keep staying super faithful to making sure we do everything perfect all the time, which, stressor, <laughs> have you ever been tried, tried to be perfect all the time? So, you know, hey, well, let's try and make this perfect all the time. Well, so in the middle of this is when Jesus shows up. So, I mean, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow in and of itself. Like, hey, this thing that you guys are trying really, really hard to follow because that one time that your people, or not that one time, but that big time in your history when you didn't follow it, you actually got kicked out and a bunch of bad things happened. Yeah, you actually have to change how you're doing that. Well, that's a, that's kind of hard. So th there's that. And then there's the issue of Jesus' message itself. It was hard to understand. And it was different. And I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. The, the core of the law was more of do this and don't do that. That's easy. We're, we're great at making rules. You know, that, that that's perfect. But then when you get to more of the heart issue, that's a lot more complicated. Think about when you were a kid, right? And so you know to make your parents happy, you do the right things. It doesn't matter what your heart is, just as long as you do the right thing. So that was their focus. We're doing the right thing. Well, so then Jesus says, and hey, by the heart is what's really going on here. Oh, oh, wait, oh. Well, that's not what we were thinking. So, you know, it's a lot easier for Israel to, to believe um, when God is just showing them sympathy. Hey, you guys are in, slave, in slavery. That's bad. I'm going to try and help you with that. Whereas, you know, Jesus didn't come with that message. I mean, he did come with the, you know, to, to set the captives free, but they didn't really understand that the, that the law was <laughs> their captivity. <laughs> so <laughs> they thought it was Rome that was their captivity. It was not. Um, so then we get to Exodus 6, 9, and a, a very, in just a sh very short period, everything changes. In 4, here they are believing. They're, they're believing the crap out of this. They're like, we got this. We're believing. Well, then in chapter 5, Moses and, jo Moses and um, uh, Aaron take their message to, to the Pharaoh. And he's like, yeah, no, that's not really going to happen. You guys are obviously bored. You know what? Stop giving them the materials that they need. Make them go get the materials. But they have to give the exact same quota. Because obviously they're bored. That sounds like a father, doesn't it? <laughs> like, oh, you're you're bored. Go go outside and pick some grass. So, uh, uh, so the, and then at this point, the the overseers who are themselves Israelites, they're they're Hebrews. They um, they get really discouraged. They see Moses and Aaron. They're like, you did this to us. This is all your fault. So it trickles down. Will you get down to chapter six? Two short chapters after they believed, and this is what it says. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. That's a far cry from where we just were about believing. So, um, and I'll get to that. In well, let me let me let me come back to that. Okay, so then we hop down here, um, and I didn't write where, where this is from, much to my disappointment. Um, I want to say it's about. It's when they're running away from Pharaoh and they get to the to the Sea of Reeds. So that's probably around like <coughs> chapter 14 or something, and they're, they're hemmed in. And it says this, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So, um, some, some mixed, some mixed feelings here. And then we get down here, and this is from, uh, the book of Numbers. Um, it's, I don't remember exactly where. I could look it up if you guys were that interested, but I want to say it's somewhere around, like, 17 or something. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Oh, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. This this quote, I, I decided to take that, that quote from Numbers out. This one is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses like 1 through 8. 
Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things scattered, uh, occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts, our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. As um, and in a and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, um, that brings a very important point that I want to make. This is the very first point I want to make, and I think it has the biggest weight out of all the, other point, all the five or six points that I'm making. Israel never really believed. So when you say, okay, well, why did Israel believe Moses' claims but not Jesus? Well, they didn't really, not wholehearted. So they believed at first, like, with their minds, but it never really went past that. It never went to the place of their, their actions. And James tells us that that kind, of, that kind of belief is just dead. So, yes, they did believe at first in an intellectual manner, but faith is much more than intellect. And when the opportunity came to put that faith into action, they said, you know, Moses, you're making things work worse for us. We didn't really even want to go here in the first place. So, throughout the law, it steadily gets worse and worse. You, for those of you who are taking me up on the challenge and reading through the law, you see the way that it gradually just decays and, and gets worse and worse and worse, even to where Moses is, is, gets involved with it. Um, and, you know, he starts, God says, hey, speak to the rock. And he's like, I only hit the rock. And Jesus, God's like, is that what you too? It, it too, Brute? So, so then, uh, you know, so that you see this gradual decline, and, and, and it's filled with a bunch of them doing a bunch of bad things. And some of the things I want to mention, um, they rebel against the leaders. Um, which is, which the Bible says is the same as witchcraft. So um, anytime that there's a, a, a rebellion against the leaders that God has appointed, you know, that's that's not a great thing. So then com complaining about their problems, uh, disobeying God by worshiping idols that the priests made, they, they, there was a wholesale not believing. So then pretty much you see them, you see them kind of being dragged along by God. So like God's like, hey, you're my people. And they're like, eh, eh, whatever. And so he's just like, you're my people get over here and they're just kind of like do we have to i mean egypt was fine and so they keep trying to go back to slavery and god's like all right i ain't playing for reals and so you know the question is why did israel believe moses claims but not jesus well it seems like by and large you really didn't and then you go forward in israel history and it doesn't ever get better they, be they become a kingdom they're still disobeying him and it's like year after year after year, and, and don't take my word for it, read the law, and then read the history books, and then read, well, actually, you can just go there, and you can see they just keep going their own way. And then you get to the prophets, and, and the prophets say, ever since your forefathers, you've always gone your own way. And it's like, yeah, yes, that's, that's exactly true. So, um, you know, it seems like more than less, um, they gave Jesus about the same reception as they gave the prophets, about the same reception as they gave uh, Moses. <laughs> So it's not, this isn't anything new. Um, this is, you know, they, they've always not believed. And so then the question is, well, why did he even choose Israel? Well, first off, he didn't choose Israel according to their merit. He didn't, he didn't do that so that nobody can brag. Okay. He didn't, he never chose Israel according to what they did or what they could have done. He chose because of his, his idea going on, his grace, his mercy, his plan. And then the next thing is, so why did he even choose Israel in the first place? Well, Here's the thing. We like to think that we're better than Israel, but it really wouldn't have mattered too much because anybody would have done what Israel did. A slow, steady, steady decay. And before you say, oh, no, I would never do that. Have you ever sat around complaining about your problems? That's what Israel did. Have you ever um, talked poorly about a religious leader that you had? Yep, that's what Israel did. So maybe, maybe don't think that you're that much better than them. Uh, next point, uh, in Hebrews 3.10, it says, that, that is why I was angry with that generation, I said. Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So the second point, Israel had a long history of not believing. The first point, if you guys remember, I just said it, was that they didn't believe, really, in the first place. So you can't really say, why did they believe Israel, I mean Moses, but not, not Jesus, because they never really believed. Second point, Israel had a long history of not believing, so it wasn't like a one-and-done kind of thing. Uh, and I already said this, we, already do, we, already, we also do this. God tells us not to do something, we do it anyways. We use foul language when the Bible says not to. We lie. 
we live for ourselves, we don't work, we eat poorly, we don't care, take care of the planet. Um, and that, that's one of the things that you see people doing all the time. I was watching this one pastor. He was probably, I don't know, two, two or 300 pounds, you know, and you could tell that it was just because he was overeating. It wasn't like a medical condition. It, it, he was overeating, and I actually knew the guy, and I'm telling you it was because he was overeating. And uh, so then he's sitting there talking about how disgusting it is for people to not control their sexual urges and how they need to get off of porn and all this different stuff. And I'm just thinking, you know, if you controlled your urges, it might go a little bit further into telling somebody else to control their urges. Just throwing this out there. So, you know, he, he, he was a big fan of, uh, of um, comfort food. He was a big fan of it. That was like his thing. It was his bread and butter. So then for people like me that that's not our thing, our thing is more sexual in nature, it's like, oh, well, your lust is bad, but my lust is acceptable. It's like, ah, hmm, hmm. Or like how a lot of times throughout Christian history, we've kind of forgotten the whole thing where we were supposed to be taking care of the planet. So it's like, ah, oh, no, it's fine. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to leave the shower running for an hour and a half. It's fine. It's not like New Mexico is actually literally running out of water or anything. It's totally fine. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to recycle. I'm just going to throw my trash on the ground. I'm not even going to, if it falls out of the trash can, I don't even care. It's like, well, you know, God actually did tell us that we were supposed to be taking care of the planet. Uh, so the little things like this that we just kind of ignore them. Oh, it's just a little thing. Well, well he did kind of tell us to do it and whatever. Um, we don't take care of the planet. We have bad relationships with our parents. That's one of the things, actually the last thing that is said in the Old Testament, the very last message that God said. Okay. It, he, this is, this is the, what the prophet Malachi said. He said, okay, so... The whole point of this is so that the that the parent that the children and the parents will be reconciled together and their and their relationships will heal. And if they don't, I'm going to come and destroy them. That was the whole purpose of Jesus coming was to reconcile fathers with their children and and to make the family stronger and to and to bring reconciliation. So then you have Christians nowadays who are like, I hate my father. I substituted him with a real father. This is my this is my what do they call it? My my my. It's not your real father. It's your um. What? No, it's like a mentor father. It's like um, um, my spiritual father. This is my spiritual father, my spiritual mother. And it's like, yeah, that's great and all, but God still wants you to have your relationships reconciled. <laughs> so, I mean, that that is something that you still need to work towards. Oh, no, because God understands because he's just a big old jerk. I understand that, but, I mean, as much as it depends with you, you should still reconcile that relationship. That's a whole purpose of the prophets. That's the very last thing that God had to say for 400 years before Jesus came. I think it was kind of a big issue. But nowadays you see Christians just kind of like, relationships aren't that important. The whole purpose of the law wasn't just loving God, it was loving people. If you're not loving people, you're not following the law, you're not following God's command. And so that takes us kind of full circle. And um, we say homosexuality is okay. How many times do you hear people say, that? well, you know, the Old Testament is dated. Homosexuality is okay because, you know, love is love. And it's like, well, I hear what you're trying to say, but listen to that. First off, love is not love. I can't, I think it's commonly accepted that I cannot have sexual intercourse with my children. That's not okay. Most of us, hopefully, hopefully would say it's not okay if I have sex with my dog. Hopefully. Please say you would say that's not okay. Uh, most of us would say, hey, if somebody's underage, in fact, I, I don't really believe in the underage thing because that makes it sound like once you hit 18, everything's fine. But studies show that a woman's um, uh, cervix doesn't get mature, reach maturity until they're actually into their 20s, which means they can get increased risk of cancer um, in their, in their well, actually the whole, the whole section, can get increased risk of cancer. So I'm actually a big fan of not the age of 18, maybe you should wait to have sex until you're about 21, just from a medical kind of side point. That's not a spiritual thing. It's just medical. medical. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to point to the Bible and say, the Bible says this here. No, I'm not. I mean, there's nothing there. I'm just saying it's smarter for you. Anyways, um, so then we say things like, oh, hey, homosexual is okay when God said it isn't. But I just want to live this way. What, what, what's the matter? The matter is that God said no. It's that simple. Like, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. If God said no, it's no. Like, that's just how it is. You don't have to say, okay, it's okay for me to lie because, you know, I have a really good reason. No, God said, hey, don't lie. So don't lie. You know, it, it, we, we always come up with these little little things, and we're still doing the exact same thing. We're, we, we say, I believe in God, but then our lives are not believing in God. 
And uh, so, you know, that's just a few examples. We gossip, we complain, then we think we are better than they. Well, they saw miracles, you know, they saw big things happen in, in the desert. God, you know, causing manna to fall from the sky. They saw miracles. Yeah, and we have Jesus, which is, by the way, the greater revelation, the greater miracle is Jesus coming. We, we have that. We, we have something that was hidden. It was a mystery of the ages, and we have it. So you can't really point back and say, but they have miracles. But we have Jesus. <laughs> so what does it matter how many miracles they had? So, I mean, but then there's other things that we still do, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, that shows our disbelief. So, uh, the third point that I want to make, there were some who did believe in Jesus. There were some, there were some in, when Jesus came, there were some who believed. But the, then there were a lot of people who had hard hearts, and they didn't believe. So you can't say, why did Israel believe Moses, but, but they didn't believe Jesus? Some did believe Jesus. So there's that. Um, in the Bible, belief in God is, is followed by action. If you believe in God, you follow his commands. It says that. If you say you love him, you follow his commands. It's one of those things. Um, if, you if you believe, you do. Israel tried to rebel, and God dragged them forward to their freedom, and so there wasn't really a whole lot of um, love and you so you you see him being patient with them and patient with them and in the prophets you kind of see the frustration and uh, yes God does actually experience emotion just because he knows something's going to happen doesn't mean it is an experience emotion and so he he's talking to the prophets and he's like look okay I, I don't really understand where the confusion is I, I told you not to do this and you're doing it anyways and then you stand before me and say I'm a, I, I'm saved I'm one of your children you realize that these sacrifices you're making to me are completely pointless and void because you're still doing these things I told you not to do. So uh, the fourth thing, uh, when Israel was uh, were slaves, they really had no purpose. They really had no drive, no, no, no thing going on there. Well, but then Israel, while Jesus was alive, they had, they had a purpose. It, but it was a wrong purpose, but they had a purpose. So they weren't just slaves anymore. They had the purpose of, hey, we are holding up the law until the Messiah comes here, and he's going to wipe everybody else out. It's going to be awesome, and I'd be there for it. So they were really looking forward to this. They had they had a purpose. It was a wrong one, but they had one. And so then he disrupted that, and it was kind of not something they were interested in hearing. So then the, fir the fifth thing um, as to why did Israel believe Moses' claims but not Jesus they thought they were better than others. They didn't understand that nobody was good enough. They missed the whole point of the law. The law was given in part to show that the need for a savior because they weren't good enough. But instead they looked at the law and said, I can do that. And so they, they thought that they could. And they thought, ah, if I, if I just mess up a little bit, it's, it's okay because there's the sacrifices. They missed the whole point. I believe it's uh, James that tells us, if you mess up one part of the law, you mess up in the whole of the law. So it doesn't matter how good you get at following one of the commands. If you're following... A different, if you're breaking a different command, well, you've broken the whole thing. You're guilty of the whole thing. And that was the purpose of the law. So some people look at the law and they say, you know, it didn't, uh, it didn't do this, it didn't do this. Women's rights and, and, and slavery and all these things. It's like, first off, it's not as bad as you're making it. As somebody who's made their whole life pursuit studying the law, it's not as bad as people make it out to be on atheist websites. Second off, uh, besides, besides that, I got a little bit sidetracked, but... Um, Second off, the law was not meant for social reform. It was meant to point forward to God. It was meant to, te to teach him very important things. Paul even talks about this, but the problem is people don't really read the Bible. <laughs> he talks about, okay, so the law was given to us as a guide until the Messiah came. So we kind of understand the whole thing of, of you know, well, I don't really want to spoil it for you. I believe it's in um, Galatians. I believe it's in Galatians. Probably in Galatians. Anyways, so read that through, and, and you can kind of see. Um, he gives he Paul gives I think four different re purposes of the law being given. Anyways, um, okay. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders they gave Jesus the biggest problem, and they refused the evidence because of politics or because of bias or because of this and that. So this is the ironic thing. Okay, the Pharisees and Jesus believed in most doctrine doctrinal things, but the most um. 
backlash that Jesus experienced was actually from the Pharisees and religious leaders. And uh, part of that was because of politics, part of that was because of bias, part of that was because of, um, you know, power plays and that kind of stuff. Part of it was because of arrogance, and you can kind of see that in the, in the passages. They didn't want to admit that he was smarter than them, they didn't want to admit, you know, they didn't want to lose their place, they didn't want things to change, he just kind of wanted to hold down the status quo. And here's the thing, that's a fact of life. If you ever become a pastor, if you want to have people oppose you, make a change. It doesn't matter what change it is. Make a change. When people see something in their church change, they get very defensive. Oh, I don't like that. And so they start attacking, and they don't know who to attack, so they attack the new guy, the pastor, right? Because even though he's trying to make the church better, they see, ah, I'm being, I'm being threatened. And so they get like, ah. And it's the same thing people do. I mean, think about the, the, the older people who their parents, you know, they're like 50 or 60 years old and something somebody wants to mess with how their parents did something. They're like, no, don't mess with my father's house. He built that out of his two, own two hands. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter, though, because it's dilapidated and breaking. But, you know, they, they don't care about that. Um, anyways, the people believed Jesus was a prophet of some kind, or at least a good person, but they didn't have understanding, and he spoke to them in parables, and he did this on purpose, um, partly to hide his messiahship from them. And you might say, how can he possibly judge them if he hid it from them? Here's the thing. He does this thing sometimes where he takes people with where they are. Okay, so here's a good example. Pharaoh, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but... Pharaoh hardened his heart first, and God just shaped the clay that was already there. And that's kind of the same thing that's happening here. Um, and a little more complicated than that, and I don't really want to give you the answers. I kind of want to just give you something to think about. It says um, that their ears were deaf and their eyes blind, lest they hear and see and repent and turn, and he saved them. So that's something you should think about, and you should definitely read that and uh, think about it. I don't want to just give you the answers, because I feel like, you know, if I do all the study for you it makes it where it's not as not as fun you don't find things out you don't learn things and that kind of stuff and then also i mean i think the results speak for themselves nicole's been reading acts uh, like all week so you know hey, huzzah it works <laughs> anyways um he spoke to them in parables just as they read the law and prophets with a veil over their face they were veiled from the meaning of jesus words in fact um paul i believe paul um elaborates on this i believe it's in saint corinthians he says that when People still now go to the law with veils over their face um, when they don't have when they haven't accepted Christ. They don't they don't understand it, and that's one of the problems that I'm seeing is a lot of Christians nowadays who call themselves Christians and still have no understanding of the law and actually get very excuse me get very angry about it. Um, oh well, God had no right to do this and God had no right to do that. It's like you know you you really might want to be careful because that's showing that there's still a veil over your heart uh, over your heart. So here's the thing. Some of you probably got a little bit nervous with what I just said, so let me explain myself, okay? So you um, read the Bible, the, the law, and it just doesn't make really make sense. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you read the law, and you have that in your heart that you're just like, he shouldn't have done that, and you just start kind of getting like, kind of mad about God over it. it. It's struggling to understand something. That's not what I'm talking about. Everybody struggles to understand parts. Don't worry about it. That, that's that's going to happen. You keep studying. God shows you little bits, by, little bits by little bits. But then there's a difference as when people go to it and they don't like what God chose to do, so they like become his judge. You know, well, he the holy war was wrong. God had no right. God had every right. <laughs> Just, you know, he doesn't have to do things that we like. Oh, well, female equality, he should have, he should have what? None of your business what he should have done. He did what he did, and that's none of your concern. Like, when you go to it with judging God, that is, a, there's a veil over your heart. When you go to it trying to understand that is a sign that the veil has been lifted. And so God, and Paul talks about this, about how when people go and, and, and the, if they don't have not accepted Jesus, there's still a veil over their heart. The Jews now that still today, that still follow the law and, and have not accepted Jesus, there's a veil over their heart. They, it's, they're blinded to the mysteries of the prophets. So they're able to read something and understand how it applied back then, but they're not able to get past that into its fulfillment, its purpose, its, its grander scheme, its foreshadowing. They miss all that because they've still got the veil over their heart. Um, so, there was a veil over the people of Israel. This veil was not there. Um, as far as I can tell, it was not there originally. Um, when Israel was first slaves, uh, it, it appears that it was not there originally, but through their hardening of heart, the veil went up, and then they just kind of kept it up there. And so then they thought, oh, we're doing better now because we're following the laws, but they missed the purpose of the law, so the veil was still there. 
So you, the, the, the veil was still there, and it caused two different reactions from the people with the veil still being there. I'm going to obey the tradition with the veil there, or I'm going to disobey the tradition with the veil there. See, either way, the veil is there. And the problem was that they weren't getting that. So it's easier to believe someone uh, heard from God than it is someone is God. It's easier to face laws than it is to trust God. And let me take those two statements one at a time. First off, it's easier to believe someone heard from God than to believe that someone is God. Hey, I was praying and I felt God told me this. You don't really have that big of a problem. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, even religious people who aren't Christian, they still kind of believe an idea of this. Like, oh, okay. Like, you had a spiritual encounter. Okay, I can dig it. But then somebody shows up and says, I am God. And you're like, you're a whack job. I mean, unless you're Jonestown. But I mean, most people, by and large, not just in the church, you're like, okay, this guy is crazy. So then the next thing, it's easier to face laws than it is to trust God. If we can face laws, this is what we tell ourselves, I can be good enough. I don't need grace because I can be a master of the law if I just try hard enough. It's easier to face laws. But it's a lot harder to trust God. When you're faced with something, it doesn't make sense. God's not being fair. The rules aren't clear. You're, you're, you're facing health concerns. You're facing problems with your, with your life. You're facing problems in your job. It's a lot harder to take that and trust God. That's a lot harder. It's a lot easier to say, hey, if I do this, then God will bless me and leave me alone. I mean, th we've all been there as Christians. Like, okay, so what you're saying is as long as I, like, do, as long as I'm a good person, God won't let bad things happen to me, and, and I can just kind of live my life, you know? And then bad things happen, you're like, oh, I guess I wasn't good enough. And it's like, well, it's not really the point that God's trying to get across to you. So I think all of those kinds of kind of add up, and I'll close this out. Look. We talk about we talk about believing God. Here's the thing. If you really believe God, it will show in your life. So I want you guys to think back over your la over the, your past week, your past year, your past 10 years. And I want you to look at that and say, "Have I been on an upward trend or a downward trend?" Don't answer this out loud. This is just for your own self. Am I closer to God or farther from God? Do I understand the Bible more or less? Do I read the Bible more or less? Have, have I served people more or less? Have I, do I pray more earnestly, more or less? Do I have a heart for something, anything? I mean, anything, you know, orphanage, the, the, the food pantry, I, I don't really care, just a, a passion for something. Is there a passion in my heart that somebody would be reached? That, some, that somehow I could contribute to this? And does, does it, does it, not just impress on your heart, oh, that's a touchy-feely thing, but impress on your heart to the point that you do something about it. Like, hey, I don't have the funds to do this. I'm going to go get a job so I can pay for this missionary to feed these people. See, now, now, it's, now it's belief because your, your belief has legs to it. When there's no legs to your belief, it's just, it's just an idea in your head. It's like this. I am a writer. How do I know? Have I written anything? Oh, well, no. See, I'm not a writer then, am I? It's just an idea in my head. See the difference? Like if, if you if you just have an idea, oh, that would be fun to do that. Oh, it would be fun to be a professor at a university. Are you one? No. So you're not really one. Oh, yeah, I am one because I have it in my heart. N no, no, that's not how it works. A Christian with beliefs is not really a Christian. It has to come out in emotion. And here's the thing. Some of you might, might come to this point because I came to this point about a year or two back where you say, so I'm not really even a Christian. Honestly, if I look at my life and I say, you know, I'm just not really even a Christian. This is a good place to get to because now you're aware of the problem and you can recommit your life to God and you can, you can focus back on God and say, okay, what is getting in the way of me focusing on God? Okay, I'm moving that out of the way now. And you're, you're going to keep waiting for, for you to feel it. Oh, I'll, I'll do it once this happens. Or I'll, feel, I'll do it once I feel like reading the Bible more. Or I'll, I'll do it when... I move out, or when I grow up, or when I'm 30 years old, or when I have kids, or when I have a job, or when I, you see what I mean? We always have these like lists of conditions. Here's the thing. There's no better time than now, and there will never be a time that comes up when you say, okay, I feel like reading the Bible now. You're going to actually have to do it. In fact, for people who grew up reading the Bible, it's harder, because you did it, you lost the habit, and then something else took its place as a habit, and so now you have to get rid of a new habit and then relearn that habit. That's hard. Be, you're starting not just at ground zero, you're starting at negative. And that's hard. But you can do it. I mean, I did it. I, I now read the Bible again every day. I mean, that was a very serious 
have it to, to get back into. It was very hard. I didn't have time for it. It didn't make sense. I was tired of reading the same things over and over again. I was tired of having fights with people about what what, what scripture meant. I was tired. I was just tired of the whole thing. I was tired of the, the scene, the atmosphere, just all of it. I had other things to do. I had better things to do. I had books I wanted to read more. I had things I wanted to do more. And so it wasn't something I wanted to do, but there was an uphill grind and I kept going and I kept going. And now I'm reading it every day. It, you have to get to that point where you just keep powering through until, until you know, you get, get it. Because if you keep waiting to want to do it, you're, you're never going to actually do it. It's, it's never going to happen. You might as well, you know, work towards it now. Um, it's like, uh, for instance, Eli wants to be in the Marines. He can't just, like, show up one day and be in the Marines. Like, he's got to practice for it. He's got to prep and study. And then throughout the course of preparation time, he'll be in the Marines. See how that works? Same thing. So, uh, you know, I found this, I found myself in this place, you know, hey, am I even really a Christian? And I did a serious analysis and I changed that. So get to that point in your life and say, hey, am I following in the steps of Israel? Because remember, the, the Egyptian, the, the, the slaves, they didn't follow Jesus <laughs> because, you know, they had their own reason. And then, you know, when they had their own law, they didn't follow Jesus. And then when Jesus came, they didn't follow Jesus. So there will always be excuses and reasons not to. Um, I hope that this lesson was encouraging for you. I don't want to tear you down. But at the same time, it's important. Paul says, or, ye, this might have been Jesus. Paul or Jesus say to, to, to take a look at our faith with much fear and trembling. To see, you know, lest we get to the end and realize that we ran in vain. So, I mean, that's kind of a kind of a big thing to say. And I think that's something that we as Christians don't really take. You know, hey, I'm a Christian. You know, I've been to church. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, a lot, a lot more to it than that. Um, for instance, me being a, an associate pastor and still questioning whether I was even saved. So it's not about position. It's not about that. You know, get back in church. COVID, we're, we're past COVID now. Get back in church. Get back into reading the Bible. Pray. I mean, goodness sakes. You can pray and read the Bible from anywhere. And tell Jamie that too. You can be have double pneumonia and still pray and read your Bible. So, okay. Uh, we're done. Next week we're going to look at, I know I said this last week that we're going to watch this video this week. Then I, I just got to thinking about that question that, that Brittany wrote, brought up. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to look at this question. So we'll look at it next week, why I, tr why I trust the Bible, chapter 11. So any questions or comments before I quit? No, no, no. I'm closing. <laughs>